say this, but um, the uh, Lottie, the, not Lottie Moon, but Annie Armstrong, and being the North Am uh, American Mission offering that we take every year, um, I've been to South Padre twice for spring break. Um, one time I took my teenagers, well actually just the boys, um, up there, and uh, I think it was a trip that we took. It was just a guy thing. Uh, Laura had taken the girls in our youth group, and they went to uh, a place up here, a uh, little, well, i got to put my directions, maybe that way. Uh, and they went to a campground, and they rode horses and did kind of girl things and uh, had a good time. The boys wanted to go to uh, Port Aransas and... Uh, go out there on the beach and we rented a condo, it was a very strange condo. Um, all the rooms had uh, some type of animal prints on them, a zebra and uh, tigers and things like that. And uh, the first night we decided to go out onto the beach and we met a young man um, and I will take what Pastor said, they did not come to dress rehearsal, or this person didn't come to dress rehearsal dressed. Uh, and he was drunk, and all I could think of is I've got these teenage boys, and this is the first thing that they see on the beach. Um, well, my other trip over there happened to be, uh, again, over spring break, and uh, I drove my wonderful first car I ever had. It was a yellow Pinto station wagon. Um, it, uh, it got me where I needed to go. Uh, I had several, no, I shouldn't say several, I had three accidents uh, in that car. Uh, each time somebody hit me from behind, and each time my car was perfectly fine and everybody else's car was not. Um, but anyway, I took this trip and I went down there where there were some other students, and uh, I would say like maybe 100, 150 uh, and they were there. They were all from um, the BSU. Uh, we didn't call it BSM lat, um, back then, but BSU. And it was about, like I said, 100, 150 students that would go to Padre Island um, every year during spring break so that they could share the gospel with people like that young man that we met on the beach. Uh, and so know that your money... Uh, when you give to this offering is used in a mighty incredible way there not only with things like that with college students uh, but many different missions where they're trying to grow uh, plant churches uh, here in America a uh, variety of different ways that it could be used and so I pray that you continue uh, to be praying about that and if the Lord leads you that you would uh, contribute to Annie Armstrong all right, I, um, I want to share a word from you, and this is actually something that uh, the Lord shared with me back in, in October, and uh, I, uh, I mentioned it to Daniel that I would like to share it with the church sometime when um, he felt that it would be appropriate um, for me to do it, uh, and God has allowed this time um, to be so, and, uh, and so I hope that, um, that you can walk away with what the Lord wants you to hear from this message. It comes from Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 36. And um, I have never been, well, I shouldn't say never, but uh, I, I'm used to, in, uh, when Daniel first came here and we started using this system, that I would get his um, slides and, uh, and, and his come, and you can't change any of the slides uh, you can't edit it, you can't fix it, and, and I'll be honest with you, there were things that he would send slides, and I, uh, I had my little pet peeves that I didn't like things, but, um, and then I sent this to him this week for him to put it up, and he couldn't change it, and that's the reason it's so small. I just didn't think about the fact that, oh yeah, this has got to be up there in front of people. Uh, but this is what it says. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, and go on ahead of him to the other side while he, he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up, up on the mountainside by himself to pray. 
And later that night he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffered by waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them and walking on the lake. Well, that must have been a sight. That was one of those things that, that uh, as a kid, I would start trying to picture this in my head, of a man just walking on the water, and that's something that I've never seen before. I think that I would have felt much like the disciples. He goes on and says, When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they were climbing into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Well, this is a story that comes after the fact that Jesus had just fed 5,000 men. Uh, and, it's, and it's more than just them, because when they count things like this, they only count the men. They don't count the women. They don't count the children. So they take this, this uh, bread, and they take um, the fish that were uh, offered up to them, and Jesus prays over it, and as you know, it is basically just multiplied. Jesus has done something incredible, something amazing, something that was not expected. Now, I don't know if you've ever been uh, in a situation like this where you experience, and we can go to the next slide, where, where you have experienced the power of Jesus. I can think of, of, of a couple of times that I can think of. Uh, one time coming from Waco, and I, I think I've shared the story, so I'm not going to tell the whole story. But I, I, I got to give God the credit for this because I can't explain it any other way. But I drove from Waco in an old suburban with a group of kids. Um, I had to uh, uh, get somebody to jump start the car. I was afraid to stop the car in any way. And once we got on the road from Waco to Austin, uh, we were trying to get to Cherry Road Baptist Church in South Austin, and we made it on a tank that said empty from Waco all the way to Austin. And once we got into the parking lot, the car died. I can't explain it any other way to you than that was Jesus. Um, I can't explain to you that a couple of years ago how uh, we got word in our Sunday school class that Hal couldn't come to church that day. He wasn't feeling well. That there was something wrong with his, his, his I don't remember if it was his hip or his knee, but he didn't feel like he could come to church. And our youth group, we always end, uh, whether it's Wednesday night or Sunday morning, we always ask about praises and, and prayer requests. And when we heard that, we decided to pray for, for Val. And uh, we, we finished that up. We got um, into church. And by the time church was ready, there was Hal coming in, uh, Val, excuse me, coming into the church. And I said, oh, Val, we didn't expect you to be here. And I remember his word, maybe not word for word, but I remember his word. He said, I wasn't feeling well, but all of a sudden I just felt like I could do this, and so I came. I can't explain it, but I can tell you that, that, that it has to be Jesus that did that. There's no other way. And so um, maybe you have had experiences where you have uh, experienced that power of Christ, whether it's in a church or in home or at work. Uh, my last one uh, that I want to share, and, 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 and this is, Probably, well, I know it's happened before. I don't know if I've ever shared it with you, but it happened again um, last week. Um, we, uh, I work at the middle school. My job is supposed to be working with students that struggle in math. And so I have one seventh grade math teacher that I work for, I think it's for uh, five, excuse me, five periods that I go in there and I help her in the classroom. Um, teach the seventh graders, and then I have one eighth grade class um, where they're learning um, algebra, pre-algebra, uh, and I go in there and I help her. Well, 
she's been pregnant this whole time. And uh, she gave birth um, to her baby girl about two weeks ago now. And, uh, well, she, w she wasn't there for the last week before spring break. Uh, and we've had several teachers that have been gone for one reason or another. And when teachers don't show up, of course, they try to get subs. And that's what I used to do at the middle school. Uh, but when you don't have enough subs, then they say, okay, we need the, the TAs. That's what I do. We need you to go in there, and we need you to be in the classroom. We need you to teach, uh, be the head teacher of this class. And so I'm in this, this uh, pre-algebra class, and uh, we've already gone over the instructional part. And so one of the young men said, uh, uh, and it's really rare that any of them call me Mr. Hossel anymore. They call me Big Red, um, I, if you can figure that one out. Um, but anyway, he, he, he said, uh, uh, Big Red, I've got to ask you a question. I mean, you, you wear red all the time, and uh, you drink Big Red, and I just got to know why you like Big Red. Well, please understand that this is after the fact that I'm, I'm telling some of the co-workers, oh, man, this is a lot of work to do. I mean, we've got kids, and we're supposed to have, like, in the low 20s, uh, one to about 22, 23 students, and a lot of these classes... Uh, because of shortages, you have like maybe 30 to 35 kids in there. Uh, and you're trying to explain uh, math concepts. Most people, most uh, teenagers do not like math. Um, I happen to like it. it. To me, it's very exact and very precise. And there's no, um, uh, it's not subjective. And I, that's what I like, I think, most about it. And so I'm trying to to uh, do this, and I get a little frustrated and go, man, that gave me a headache, and da 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 and, and, and there are times that I say, why does God have me in a classroom like this? Well, it's for these kind of questions, because the young, again, he said, why do you like red so much? And I said, well, the short story is, is that, that I experience a lot of uh, unloving situations in my life, a lot of loss and stuff. And, and I didn't know what it was to, uh, or I felt like I didn't understand what it was to be loved. And then I met Jesus, and I understood that he loved me so much that he would shed his blood for me, his red blood for me. And I will never uh, uh, get that out of my mind. So red is, is very important to me. And after the fact, I got to think, well, wow, God or Lord Jesus just gave me that opportunity because I can't just go and say this to these kids. But once they ask me that question or they ask me a question that, that can lead to an answer like that, legally I'm free to do it. And God gave me that opportunity to, uh, to share something of Christ, to share of his love and his graciousness. So I think that, that uh, when we, if we have that opportunity to experience the power of, of Jesus, that we must learn to acknowledge it. Um, a lot of times we get so used to things uh, happening that maybe we forget sometimes to show our gratitude for what the Lord has done and what he continues to do in our lives. Um, the story continues. It says that, that first of all, after he performed these, um, the miracle of feeding the 5,000, he also um, had healed the sick. He sends them off on a boat, and he goes and he spends time with the Father. Um, I think this is another situation where sometimes we, uh, you can go to the next slide, by the way. Um, maybe, maybe sometime Daniel can uh, testify to this or not, but uh, my wife can tell you that I'm a very strange person after I have preached. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, I think sometimes I feel uh, a little overwhelmed. Sometimes I feel tired or exhausted. Um, and, and, and I just have to have some time where it's just me and the Lord. I, I've got to um, express things to him that uh, sometimes it's like, where, where did that come from, Lord? I don't uh uh, I, I heard myself saying something. I just don't remember preparing myself to say something. And I, and I recognize that, that, that it is God, that it's him 
uh, that will put whatever in me. It's never about me, but it's always about him. And I have to give him the praise for what he is doing. And I have to continue to seek him and continue to uh, request for him to, to fill me with his spirit and to uh, never have that desire to, to say, well, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired, or, or I can't do it, I, I just don't want to do it, or whatever. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was the froggy time, or what, I, yeah, it was, that Linda said, you know, did you, you know, forced to get up, or whatever. And uh, not this morning, but there are some times that I'm, a, that, that I'm supposed to preach, and, and uh, I've laid in my bed and go, do I really want to get up this morning? <laughs> and uh, the Lord says, well, yeah, I, you, I've got you going. You're going to tell some things to the people. So, yeah, you need to get up. Um, but, but, but I um, continue to say that he went, and he went to spend time with a father. He wanted to, to speak to him, and it says that he went up in the mountains, and he went there to spend time with the father. And when he was done, he said that he came to meet them on the lake. Well, they're already off. Um, I don't know how far off. I've never been um, to the Holy Land. I've never been to this area where I can even give you an idea. But I, I, I understand the fact that it was far enough that he was going to have to walk out to get to them. And he was doing something unexpected, something that even the, the disciples weren't expecting. He was walking on the water. And I said that already. You know, as a young kid, there were questions that I have. And, and sometimes my questions got me in trouble. But, um, you know, I wanted to know if Adam and Eve had belly buttons. I wanted to know that when uh, Cain or uh, Adam and Eve's other children were ready to get married, who did they get married to? Um, I wanted to, to uh, uh, know what it was like to watch somebody... Um, go off in a chariot of fire and, and cease to be. Um, I, I wanted to know what it was to be Jesus' relatives. He, I think the two that I can remember were Josie and James. Did they, did they ever get mad or frustrated with the fact that their parents were always thanking Jesus for the food? I mean, there were things that, that I wondered as a kid. And, um, and so I wondered if I was one of those disciples and I see something that is walking on the water, would I be scared? Um, would I have the same reaction as they did? And, and I say that because these were men that got to spend day after day after day with Jesus. We get to talk about him. We get to read about him. Sometimes we get to share uh, with other people about him, but they were actually there with him. And it, does it ever come to the point where there shouldn't be anything that Jesus does that doesn't surprise them? But they're scared. Um, and, and he comforts them. He tells them that it's me. Um, and I think about that. Um, and I said that. They've spent a few years. They walked with him. They were learning from him. They were growing in their knowledge of who he was. But why were they scared? And then I think about myself and I say, well, if I'm walking with God and I'm learning and I'm growing in knowledge about Christ, why do I have fears in my life? Um, I went to visit Linda one, of the, uh, one day in the hospital and um, I was just full of emotion, I guess. I don't know. Uh, another way to describe it, but there were moments of happiness, there were moments of sorrow, and there were moments of anger. Um, and, and part of my anger was is that this is a sister in Christ, and, and she was going through a lot of different things that I didn't understand. Um, there are a lot of things that happen in the world today that I don't understand. Um, I think that, that or I, I guess... In reading scripture and people that I grew up with, uh, there were certain things that I were taught to do the right thing, to be respectful, um, and, and uh, when truth is shared, that, uh, that it always overcomes. 
And, and I see a moment like this and I say, well, is this fair? Um, is it fair for her to be this sick? Is it fair for her to, to go through all the harassment that she did? And, and even in praying for her, I, I just had to cry because I guess part of me just being a man, I want to have the answer. I want to be able to fix the problem. And, 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 and then there's part of me that says, okay, God, are we going to see something happen here? Is there, is there going to be something to be overjoyed of? And I don't know, a couple of weeks later, Larry's talking to me and he tells me uh, about Texas Rangers and, and this person um, who was doing things that they weren't supposed to be doing. And, and I had that opportunity to go, wait a minute, I was scared over here and trying to look for an answer. I had no business being scared because God is always in control. And he took care of the situation. I didn't need to do anything, and nobody else needed to do anything, but God did what he chose to do according to his will. So why are we scared? When, Jesus saw, or when Peter saw Jesus and recognized him, he was ready to go to him, and he said, If you, Lord, tell me to come to, uh, tell me to, come to you, well, here's, here's the part that, that I really wanted to share with you, and uh, it, it, it's some things that I didn't know about. I'm not a historian. Um, I had one pastor that I, I served with for three and a half years, and three and a half years we went over Matthew chapter 5. That's it. How he came up with, I don't know, 160, 180 sermons on Matthew chapter 5, I still don't know. But he, every week he would come with some other historical facts that he would share uh, with his congregation. And, uh, and a lot of people enjoyed hearing all of that history. I'm not really great at that. Um, I like history. I like to know, you know some things. But I don't get into you know, digging deep, 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 deep. But I did find this about the education of um, Jewish males. It says that um, back then the schools were associated with the local synagogues in the first century Galilee. Apparently each community would hire a teacher who they would call rabbi. Uh, while the teacher was responsible for the education of the village, he had no special authority in the synagogue itself. Children began to study at the age of four to five in Beth Sefer, which is what we would associate elementary school. Most scholars believe um, both boys and girls attended the class in the synagogue, and the, teach, the teachings focused primarily on the Torah, emphasizing both the reading and the writing of scriptures. Large portions were memorized, and it was likely that many students knew the entire Torah by, the, by memory by the time this level of education was finished. That's, a, that's a, the five books of the law. Uh, that's a lot of memorization. And uh, I struggle sometimes with memorizing scripture. I can teach you how to memorize scripture right now. Uh, repeat after me. Jesus wept. Okay, see, now you can never say that you've never memorized scripture. That's John 11, 35. So keep it up. But these young, young children would memorize the, the Torah. Um, they would, would uh, uh, study it, and they would practice it, and they would uh, pray with it. Um, they used it as a part of everyday life. It goes on to say, the best students continued their study while learning a trade in the Beth Midrash, which is our secondary school, we would um, say was the equivalent. They were also taught by a rabbi of the community, and here, along with the adults in the town, they studied the prophets and the writing in addition to the Torah and began to learn the interpretations of the oral Torah. They learned how to make their own applications, their interpretations, much like a catechism class might be in some churches today. Memorization continued to be important because most people did not have their own copy of the scriptures, so they either had to know it by heart, or they had to go to the synagogue to consult the, vi the village scroll. Memory was enhanced by reciting out loud, a practice still widely used in the Middle Eastern education, both Jewish and Muslim. 
Constant repetition was considered to be an essential element of learning. Now, I still think that uh, we're missing out, and, 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 and it's partly my fault, uh, that we don't encourage our children to continue to do that, to memorize scripture. Um, uh, I know that uh, when um, names are going out of my head right now, um, Amanda was here that we got the kids started uh, and memorizing the books of the Bible. Uh, and we continued to tell stories. I think it, we, could, we should get in back into practice of bringing out scriptures and, and having them memorize them uh, week by week and, and, and coming so that it can be implanted in their minds and in their hearts. I know that, again, that I'm not really great at memorizing scripture, but I know that there are moments in my life where I needed scripture, to sh whether to, for myself or to share with other people, and I know it is because God put it in my heart um, to know those. Let's go on. It says, a, very, very, uh, a few, very few of the most outstanding Beth Mirage students sought permission to study with the famous rabbi, often leaving home to travel with him for lengthy periods of time. These students were called Telmedims or Telmids. Is that right, Pastor? Close enough? Um, in Hebrew, which translates disciples. So this is what Peter is. He's a disciple. Uh, there is much more to a Telmid than what we call a student. A student wants to know what the teacher knows for a grade to complete the class or the degree or even the respect of the teacher. A Telmid wants to be like the teacher. That is to become what the teacher is. That meant that the student was passionately devoted to their rabbi and noted everything that he did and everything that he said. This meant that the rabbi Telmet relationship was very intense, personal system of education. And as the rabbi lived and taught his understanding of scriptures, his students listened and watched and uh, imitated so as to become like him, eventually they would become teachers passing on the lifestyle to their disciples or telemeds. In other words, that when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, he wanted to be like his rabbi. He wanted to walk on water. Back then, if, you're, if your rabbi walked with a, a hunchback and, a, and, a, and a, some kind of cane or something, you wanted to do that. You wanted to be like your teacher. And I wonder to myself, or wonder out loud, I guess now, do we ever seek to be like the ultimate rabbi, the ultimate teacher, Jesus? Are we ready to, if we saw him walking on that water, to, to get out there and say, okay, call me Lord, I'm going to mimic you, I'm going to be like you. Now, I, I do this a lot with our young people, I say this over, maybe you remember hearing me say this, but, but I can sum up the ministry of Jesus very easy. Love God, love others. So on a day-to-day -day basis, when it comes to us being like our rabbi, are the things that we do expressing that love for God and our love for others? When, when uh, uh, we gather as a church, do we gather to do what Jesus would do? Or do we gather with what we've always done? Do we gather to, to, to again, do like Jesus and he went out and he ministered to the sick, and he ministered to the people that were in need. He developed relationships with people, sometimes with people that were not like him. He took the time to express his love and the love of God to each person that he came in contact with. You think about the time that, uh, that he, um, when he was going to be seized and and he was in the, in the garden and he was praying to God. And he, at first he said, you know, let this pass. But he ended it by saying, it is your will, Father, not mine. I think of a lot of times in my life where I say, you know, this is really what I want to do. And I'm already starting down a bad path. 
when I'm expressing what I want to do, when I need to be like Christ and say, Father, what is your will? What is it that you want me to do? I, I, I never wanted to be a church minister. Um, I don't like church politics. I don't like watching people argue. Um, I don't like to, though I do, and I know I do, and I shouldn't, I don't like to argue about church things. I always wanted to be a, a youth evangelist, and I just wanted to go in and share the love of Christ with young people, um, to share maybe something new to them and just let them hear it. But God said, no, TJ, this is what you're going to do. And I said, well, God, I don't, uh, I don't think I'm going to be good at that. I mean, here I am questioning the Father, telling him what I can do. Well, guess what? I really can't do anything. I'm absolutely nothing without him. But it is a lot what God can do through me. And, and, and when I am a part of a church that, that over the last five years, been here five years, by the way, um, um, one of the kids asked me, are you planning to leave, TJ? No, I'm not planning to leave. Um, but this is a good length of time. Most churches I've been at, I've been for maybe three years. I've one church I was there for seven years. Um, but this has been the most fruitful church that I've ever been a part of. I've never seen, uh, for the size of our church, I've never seen so many people come to accept the Lord, come to be baptized, come uh, yearning to hear what God uh, wants them to hear. And I can, I can look over the last 30 years of ministry and say, wow, I could say me, but it, I, I'd be lying to myself. Wow, God, look what you have done. Peter began to fall, and when he did, he called out to Jesus. And Jesus immediately reached out and pulled him out of the water. We will have times where there is fear. There are times that we um, have to learn to turn to the Lord, and he will always be there to catch us. It says that, that once they got into the boat, that the winds die, and the first thing they did was begin to worship Jesus. So in summary today, I'm going to ask you, what is your experience with Christ? What have you done with those experiences that you have with Christ? with him is it something that you keep to yourself or is it something that you've gone to share with other people that they may hear what God has done I tell a lot of different stories and sometimes I don't know why and years later people will come to me and say I remember when you said blah 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 and I have to go back and go oh that's why I shared that story that day Sometimes they get mixed up. One day I got a phone call um, driving out to uh, dr um, yeah, Driftwood, um, Dripping Springs area, and it was a doctor's office. They left me a message on my phone telling me that my kidney was ready. Problem was I didn't need a kidney. So I called back real quick, told them that they called the wrong number. Please call the other number real quick, let them know. And I shared that story with some young people uh, in my church, and uh, three or four months later, the pastor's wife came to me and wanted to know um, how it worked out with my, my new liver. I said, liver? What, what are you talking about? And she goes, yeah, Sammy was telling me that you got a call, and they had a liver for you. And I said, well, first of all, it was a kidney. Um, but, yeah, and, and I explained the story to her. Um, but I think it's important that we go out and we share our experience with other people. Let them know what God is doing in our lives, what we have experienced. Do we understand that with Christ, storms may come, but we don't have anything to fear? I know that I fear in the storms, but I can look back now and say, wow, that was amazing. I was scared, and I didn't see any other, any other outcome or any way that this situation was going to get better, but I had that opportunity to look back and say, wow. It, it did get better. Um, two and a half years old, they told my mom and dad I was going to die. Um, I don't think it could be any better than to be standing before you today 
50 years later and be able to tell you how incredible our God is. It's important that we keep our eyes on Jesus, and I know that, that you probably heard that before. Uh, but if we're keeping our eyes on Jesus and we're focusing on him, we're not going to be worried about all the things that are going on around us. We're going to be doing what we need to be doing, and that's looking forward to our Lord. And, and, and when he does something, we need to, to imitate that. When we read it in our scripture and we experience that, uh, maybe for the first time or maybe over and over we continue to experience things, Maybe that's a moment where God is saying, hey, wake up and listen to what I'm telling you. Keep your eyes on him. And we also need to ask ourselves, what will we do to be more like Jesus? Remember I said, <laughs> I always thought that question, did, did the little brothers get mad when Mary said, why can't you be like Jesus? Maybe Jesus said, or maybe the, Ma, Mary said, well, maybe, you know, maybe you should be more like Jesus. But, um, yeah, we, we should be striving to be more like him and less like ourselves and less like the world. This morning in Sunday school, we talked about material um, things and uh, lust in, of the eyes and lust of the flesh and, and, and the focus is on what we have in this world. Um, we started off with that question about um, what is something that you bought, what was the first thing that you bought with your own money? Um, I don't know how many of you, maybe most of you, probably not you, Pastor. Um, I don't think you were born yet. Um, I, the first thing I can remember having was a disc camera. Anybody remember a disc camera? Yeah? Um, if you don't, it had one of these uh, rotating discs on it, like a viewfinder that you put in there, and you could put this in your camera, and you could take pictures with it, and you turned in that disc um, to the local place uh, to have it developed and stuff. And you just, you just had to have one, or at least in Referia, you had to have one of these to be cool. And uh, let me see, where, did I, where, where do I have that camera today? I don't know. I don't know whatever happened to that camera. But I can tell you the day that I met Jesus, and I can tell you where that relationship is today. What have I done with my Lord? And, and again, this is, this is talking about eternity. The relationship with him is an eternal relationship. The things of this world are, are temporary. Having, having, I love pastor shoes. I've loved pastor shoes for a long time. Um, and maybe someday I'll buy a pair like that. Um, but Jesus is going to ask me, or the Lord's not going to ask me, do you have pastor shoes? No. He's going to talk about my relationship with, with my Lord. And what have you done with that? So as we have our invitation, I